excited. All right, as we finish our pregame here, going live, welcome everybody. We just realized that this is a special webinar. Since we're on the month, we're not gonna exactly hit it, but next week is our one year anniversary. That's Don't get rusty, guys. Pablo. One year older, and we look- Send you a card. Good, all right, <laughs> fine. This is our anniversary. Fantastic <laughs> one reached. And we also have another announcement, which is actually excellent timing. Uh, and, and not because it's one year, but we have excellent news. So, next slide. <laughs> we rehearsed it. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> as you can see, this is, we've never had this slide. This is excellent. So, starting now, who knows for how long, but this is fantastic. We are generously being brought to you by Boeing. Jefferson, a Boeing company, and Four Flight. So you recognize every one of these names, hopefully, uh, as we do. They are fantastic. We appreciate this immensely that they're part of this team now, and um, hopefully we'll have some more to tell you. But we do have one thing coming up that is going on starting now. Hey, remember, you're supposed to say that generously brought to you by Boeing. Brought to you by, that's right, that's the sponsorship voice. So <laughs> this is something that Four Flight has set up with AOPA. And you can read the slide here. It's a regional flyout campaign that we're doing. And it's April, May, June, and July. There will be a grand prize drawing on August 1st. And it's essentially a way to get you flying. Uh, if you go to fourflight.com forward slash flyout, you'll get all of the information there. There's some regional packets and and all this other cool stuff, but you can see that at the end of it, there's some excellent prizes. iPads, one year performance plus subscription, a Century portable ADSB receiver, and a four flight swag bag, which really Always intrigues want me. The swag, you gotta get the swag. The swag, the swag is like being at the Academy Awards. It is. Okay, so that is from our sponsors. All right, so let's get to the uh, house cleaning. So uh, you'll see on the side, you have your a little bar for go to webinar which has your way of asking questions this is only written questions but we are monitoring them as we go throughout and we will be mentioning those as we go so if you have one on something we're talking about uh, if it comes in right on time we'll ask it if not a lot of them will just go to q a if you can stick around with us for that so that's where you will ask your questions okay this one is probably even more important than a lot of the things we do Chris, do we have Wings credit? I was just going to ask you that. I was really wondering, <laughs> can you get Wings credit for this webinar? Of course you can. <laughs> because course. through our connections at both the FAA and now Boeing, we yes. can bring you Wings credit, but right. only if you're viewing this, this webinar live, only if live. And that's the important part. We get a lot of questions about, oh, I saw this, you know, I watched it on Segway one of our many channels. We have, uh, you can see this recorded as this session will also be on YouTube channel and it is on AOPA Live. So if you search for that, you'll find that. You also see it at aopa.org and you can also search for us there or you could just go to webinars.aopa.org and we do get Wings credit. So as long as it's the email that you registered with. That's right, on your FAA account. It has to be your FAA, FAA account, yep. All right, so let's get to the good stuff. Uh, although we've done most of the great stuff, let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> so, a couple of intros. My name is Pablo Morelli. I'm the Senior Director of Flight Training Technology at AOPA You Can Fly. Fantastic long title. I have three business cards with that. Um, <laughs> and as always, we've got the very distinguished CFI, Mr. Chris Moser. Hey everybody, Chris Moser, and I'm the Senior Director of Flight Training Education, and obviously I work on the same team with Pablo, and we are working on all kinds of solutions for your flight training needs and the Flight Training Experience Survey, which is coming up soon. But I would like to make sure we mention, behind the scenes, our uh, coordinator and producer, Mr. Steven Schroeder. Say hello, Steven. Hello, Steven. <laughs> the mystery <laughs> man. Cloaked now, in darkness. Like? I was, I've never met the guy. We, this is the deal, but we will reveal him at 1 million subs. Make sure you click that like button right now. Click the like, click button. The like button. Okay, so uh, a very important anniversary edition here. We have the Flying Clubs crew, Stephen Drew. That was practice. Fantastic. <laughs> Steve, take us Thanks, away. Thanks, Pablo. Please. I'm Steve Bateman, AOPA Director of Flying Clubs. And that's me with the tea bag on the, uh, on the caricature there. Um, <laughs> Beautiful. You can probably tell why. 
<laughs> I'm also a CFI. I'm Treasurer, Maintenance and Safety Officer of a flying club, the Westminster Aerobats Flying Club, based in Frederick, of course. And I'm also a fast team lead rep uh, with Baltimore FISDO. That's my airplane, the, uh, the the middle picture there. That's the 1981 uh, Aerobat. She's called the Bat, uh, of course. And um, <laughs> wonderful airplane. It's an A152. So it's a Cessna 152, which is fully aerobatic, plus six, minus three G. Uh, and uh, fully IFR as well. Drew, over to you. Gee, thanks, Steve. So, like I said, my name is Drew Myers. I'm the handsome guy on the left there in the caricature. <laughs> uh, I'm an instrument-rated private pilot. Uh, I was actually a guest on the earlier version of Don't Get Rusty where we talked about uh, instrument rating and instrument flying, so it's good to be back. And I am also the safety officer and plane captain of the wonderful Free State Flying Club based out of historic College Park, Maryland, um, right inside the flight restricted zone there. And uh, I'm also a fast team rep for the Baltimore FISDO, and I'm happy to be here. And so you can see below there in the bottom, that's our beautiful 1976 Cessna 172M with a lot of sweet upgrades. It's a, it's not your, not your run of the mill 172, that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So uh, just going to tell you a little bit about the You Can Fly program. Um, in fact, all of us on, on, on the, the call here today, uh, we're, we're all part of the You Can Fly team. And there's, there's four sort of main components to it. There's what we call discovering aviation, our high school curriculum, I'm sure you all, you've all heard about. This is where, this is our outreach to, for, for new aviators. This is where we go into uh, essentially to high schools, to school districts. We provide a, a full curriculum for all the STEM subjects from ninth through 12th grade. And the idea is that if we can get people interested in aviation, um, then, you know, they'll, they'll, learn to fly they'll become pilots and so on it's not just for not just for piloting it's for all aspects of aviation as an industry i often talk to uh, to high schools and you know, i'll ask i'll ask students so what, what, what do you want to do and you might get a, a comment such as well i want to be a software engineer but well, that's that's nice right Pablo? that's nice um i i can't imagine how great it is no I, well I, I can tell you it's absolutely it's really good but the thing <laughs> is of course you don't you're not just you're not just writing software you're writing software for a particular purpose so having an industry in mind is is really good why not write software for i don't know for flight right that would be fantastic um or or you know the faa i guess that would be fantastic too uh and and just you know lots of things like that so what we're trying to do here is position aviation as an industry for people to to find careers so once we get people in aviation of course so uh, we want them to learn to fly so this flight training right chris do you want to talk about that one sure so and of course one of the big things too is that we consider this like a life cycle get them in teach them to fly obviously in the flight training part of it and so that's what pablo and i are part of that team working to build those resources um, including we've just launched our aopa flight training advantage program for private pilot rex and sport pilot um, and uh, other resources for them so that's kind of the deal we want to try to make sure that we can help schools deliver the best experience they can by providing whatever resources and assistance that we can do yeah, and that brings and I, us to what happens after yeah. they get the certificate, Steve. Doesn't it just? Yeah. And this is sort of what we, uh, if, if, if you remember the title all the way back in, in slide one, it's flight schools, you know, get them flying and flying clubs keep them flying. So, you know, the idea of flying clubs as part of this continuum is once people learn to fly, they need to find somewhere to land. They need to, they, they need to have the camaraderie, the social support. They need to be able to uh, remain proficient. Um, and just generally enjoy the uh, the art of aviation. So having flying clubs uh, as a as a, a, a ground base for for people like that is is really really important. And we're seeing it, Chris. I think you'll you'll probably talk to this one that a lot of the flight schools are really really busy and they just don't have the capacity to rent airplanes at the moment. And in fact, I think it's the capacity. I think also they realize that for them as a business decision, they make the most money, obviously, when they're renting an airplane and when they have an instructor on board. So it's a capacity issue. And also, you know, being in the flight training business, believe it or not, is uh, it's a tough business. And so they want to make sure that they're doing the best they can for their employees and their customers. So, yeah, that's a big thing we see is that um, they you need a place to rent. And where can you do that, Steve? Well, I, I would suggest flying clubs. And the idea here, of course, is that you have a, aircraft that are outside of the rental fleet. It's not just uh, renters and learners trying to compete with the same fleet. Notice I said learners. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is that there's a separate fleet here, which becomes then that the flying clubs. So that's what we do. We're going to be talking a lot more about that today. 
And then, then, then at the other end, of course, we know that uh, once a pilot, always a pilot, but sometimes things get in the way. And uh, after a while, if people haven't flown for, for, for a particular length of time, it might be six months, might be a year, might be two years, might be 20 years, might be 32 years. How do you get back into aviation? So this is where the Rusty Pilots program comes in. We provide a, a ground school, we provide introductions to, to flight schools and CFIs. So uh, pilots can, can return to flight, they can get their flight review. And where do you think would be a good place for them to land? What do you think, Drew? Um... I don't know, flying clubs? Oh, I, I would think so too. So there's a little bit of a feedback loop in there as well, where rusty pilots can, can, can not get rusty again by being involved in flying clubs. Okay, let's uh, roll a poll, Stephen. <laughs> We'd like to know how you fly. And, and I don't mean, you know, well or poorly or anything like that, but what, what, uh, what, how do you fly from a, from a usage perspective? What do you guys think it's going to be? Because it's like, of course, we... Well, actually, I can see what's happening, but what are your suspicions? I know that I've spent most of my uh, flying career um, either, well, luckily being paid to fly in some cases, but renting. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we we often see that it tends to be, I think, more than around or more than fifty percent pe people rent, and there's the opportunity, and that's what we want to talk about today: right. the opportunity of flying clubs. And let me temper that too with the part is that because I'm a flight instructor, I spend most of my time instructing when I fly. I don't do a whole lot of flying just on my own. Um, so that's probably part of it too. Mm. All right. Shall we? How are we doing, Stephen? All right. We got about 74% in, so that's pretty good. There we go, 75. Let's give it to another Stephen four has seconds. Blonde in. hair or brown hair? I'm, I'm <laughs> or I'm hair at all? Voice. Yeah, that's, that's a good yeah, question. Who knows? You know, mm -hmm. we, Stephen, and I both know those without hair are just more aerodynamic. So. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's go ahead and close that poll. We got about 80% response on there. Look at that. Yeah. Nice. Just like you yeah, predicted. This is, yeah, this is fairly typical. 41% um, renters, members of a flying club. Great. Welcome. 30% um, own. You know, and and we often find that people who own their own airplane might also be in a flying club because the joy of owning your own airplane is you have it there and it's convenient for you. But wouldn't it be nice to fly a different type of airplane? If you own a Bonanza. Wouldn't it be nice to fly a Cub? Um, but rather than having full ownership of that second airplane, join a flying club and share the love, share the costs. Yeah, so, a, a, a member of my flying club owns a long easy. And when he wants to, I don't know, carry more than a uh, like a, a change of underwear with him, he takes the, the Club 172 with him yeah. to, to go places in. And in, in that respect, it's not unusual, I suppose it is, but it's not unheard of that uh, people join multiple clubs to get access to different types of airplanes. All right. Thank you, Stephen. So um, you might be wondering, what is a flying club? Right? Well, there is an FAA definition, of course. Um, we, we know it's a sort of a collection of people who love sharing the costs and like hanging out together. But, you know, it's, uh, there's actually a little bit more to it than that. The FAA defines a flying club as a non-profit or not-for-profit entity organized for the express purpose of providing its members with aircraft for their personal use and enjoyment, comma, only. <laughs> And you know, that <laughs> comma only, it just gets me every time because it's, it's just so brilliant. Um, I mean, it doesn't say anything about business or, or you know, anything else in there. It's for personal use and enjoyment only. <laughs> so now, that pretty much defines it. So it's Steve, a social let, me throw one, let me throw one question out to you there as well. With that said, is it possible you might run into an organization that calls themselves a flying club but really is not this? And is that okay? Um, well, we'll come. We'll actually look at that on the next slide. I think Drew will tell us a little bit about that. And, and we we do see we do see these situations indeed, Chris, where you have to be a little bit careful. Just because the word clubs in the name doesn't mean it's all that it seems. Okay. Um, so in this case, it's a social club. You know, people like it, it, and it is a social club. I mean, essentially, the FAA and certainly the IRS view uh, um, a, a flying club as a non-profit social organization and there are good benefits that come from that rather than being called a commercial operator so you might want to think about setting up as a non-profit corporation in your state it sounds complicated it isn't it gives you liability protection um, of course the the club provides access to aircraft and club facilities for its members this is not public facing it's really important to, to, to recognize that and we'll talk a little bit about some of the limitations um, a, a little bit later it does op open the opportunity for tax exemption this is amazing you can have you can be a social club 
and you can claim, uh, you can file for tax exemption with uh, with the IRS, um, so that you're not being uh, you're not being held liable for federal income tax and in some cases uh, state income tax. Um, if you do that, file as a C7, not as a C3. This causes a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of problems. I won't go further into that, but if you need more details, just let us know. Really, what you what you what you need to set up as a non-profit corporation, tax exempt as a 501c7. It's wonderful. Some clubs are set up as LLCs. Uh, we advise a non-profit corporation because LLCs just just create more tax complications. And you'll see the um, on the on the bottom there. That's the the logo of the Westminster Airbats Flying Club Inc. And that's where the ink comes from because we are a, a Maryland non-profit corporation. Yeah, but who's the guy with the pancakes? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so we talked about what a flying club is. Um, and there's there's a lot of things that flying clubs aren't and simply legally cannot be. And the, the, the big thing there is that they can't be a commercial operator of any sort. They're not a flight school. They're not an FBO. And um, we, we see this a, a good bit too. Um, just because it has the word club in the name doesn't necessarily make it a flying club. And there there are plenty of so, high schools out there that charge. Sure, uh, sorry to membership. interrupt. Uh, you said yeah. legally. Can you possibly mm -hmm. just define what you mean by legally? Will the cops come after you? Well, no. So it's it's really about it's regulated mostly by the airport managers. Um, so they they are the the general authority on the field, and if they take issue with a club doing some of the things that we're, we're talking about here, you know, uh, advertising flight instruction, uh, giving introductory, introductory rides or scenic rides or anything like that. Um, basically, that's that's when we see airport management step in. Um, but as far as, you know, getting arrested or anything, no. <laughs> the worst that can happen is uh, you get uh, kicked off the airport. So uh, that could be a major threat to something like that. I mean, that's so. huge. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's it, it's all threat. about, it's, the, 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 the big idea here is it's all about fair play. You know, uh, flight schools carry a lot of risk. They have a lot of liability and uh, flying clubs are treated as individuals on the field. So they, they don't carry as much risk. So th that's that's the thing. We can't advertise learn to fly with us or anything like that. And down the, down below there, we, we hear this a lot, too. Well, this other club does it. It doesn't make it right. You know, there, there, have been, there are clubs out there that have been around for 50, 60, 70 years. And believe it or not, rules change and laws change. And the laws that that club was established under and is used to operating under have since changed, so they they need to you know get get ahead with the times basically. Yeah, we're often asked, uh, you know, can can we provide the uh, the FAR which regulates flying clubs, and there isn't one. It doesn't mean that they're not regulated. It just it just means they're not in the FARs. Uh, the FAA introduced things called orders, and there's one called the Airport Compliance Manual, which is where flying clubs are actually defined. That that, that description I gave, but it also is the manual that. The FAA used to delegate um, responsibility onto airport operators and managers. So any any airport public use publicly funded that's taken federal money has to has to obey some rules. And one of those rules is they need to accommodate flying clubs and they need to accommodate flying clubs separately from commercial operators. And they're held to different standards. And that's the point here that just because you're held to, to different standards, which really allows the club to operate at lower operating costs doesn't mean that you should sort of try to undercut a flight school. There's an ecosystem going on here. Mm -hmm. And so, so one of the um, things I just wanted to, okay, if I could, just one of the things I wanted to mention is that one thing that we run across, and I guess you guys can help me verify that, is that a lot of times when I'm doing things with flight schools, I will run into a school that calls itself a flying club. But in reality, when you look at what it is, it's a commercial organization. They've actually met all the requirements at the airport. They just happen to use that name, Flying Club. So is that okay to do that? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing it. It's, 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 there's, there's nothing that, that regulates the, the, the word club. But I think it's important for people to really understand, is, is it a club or is it a school? Um, and you can usually tell that from their website or, or their mode of operation. If they've got that big green sign outside that says, learn to fly with us, or they're doing introductory rides, or they're public facing, right? They, uh, people come in, the public comes in and says, uh, uh, and somebody would say, I'd like to go for an intro introductory ride, please. W within a flying club, that's certainly not allowed, or at least the, the compensation side of it. Of course, flying club members take their friends up for, for rides, but there, there should be no compensation involved there. Um, but it is okay for a business to name itself Flying Club if that's what they want to do. We just have to 
look a little bit into it and just know what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think I think uh, you know I gave a I gave a, a caution there of of clubs um, sort of overstepping the line and starting to look like uh, like schools. Well, I think it goes the other way as well. Schools should be careful; they don't just claim to be clubs in order to get benefits of lower operating costs. Now, one question we have from the audience, Steve, is that do flying clubs include military flying clubs for those who may be eligible? Is that does that fall under that category? And they also ask if there are so many, if so, are there any military flying clubs still around? There are. There are still military flying clubs around. They are somewhat different, um, mostly, of course, because they're op op often at military bases, which means that access is very limited. So, um, but so so they tend to be limited to, to members of the military, people who can get access. Uh, but there are there are still quite a few of them around. There used to be a lot more when when the the military uh, units would would essentially you know subsidize the clubs in 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 terms of of aircraft and so on. Of course, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but there are there are multitudes of clubs and military clubs are are, are certainly amongst them. So another thing we often get quite asked is, well, how is a flying club different from any other form of co-ownership? And it's certainly that a flying club is where you you, you share the costs and share the love. So you know you you you've probably heard of fractional ownerships and and partnerships and also then flying clubs. So what's the difference? Well, a fractional ownership, it's really it's really more like a timeshare. You just buy access to an aircraft, not a not a particular one, not a particular end number, but you just buy time. So if you know that you're you're going to you know a particular golf tournament every year, then you can buy time to go to your golf tournament, for example. There's no sense of ownership. There's really no sense of community. It's just buying time. Um, then there's this idea of a co-ownership. A lot of people call them partnerships. That's not quite strictly true. Let's call them co-ownerships. One or two people get together. They they share in the costs of owning and operating an aircraft. Again, not much in the way of social benefits. They may hang out, they may not. It's really just for the convenience of having a shared aeroplane. This certainly makes sense for, say, two or three owners, but beyond that, a flying club gives you a lot more, uh, I think, opportunity, a lot more, um, a lot more sort of community type of feel. Um, in the case of co-ownership, we we certainly recommend people were there then set up as an LLC for liability protection. There's no way a co-ownership can claim for tax exemption. There's no need for them to be a non-profit corporation. And then there's flying clubs, yay, non-profit social club for members only. Um, clubs may own or exclusively lease their aircraft. We'll look at that, those options in a bit. Um, the idea is access, affordability, support, camaraderie, all the things we like to do. We love our, we love what we do and we like to share it with people. Um, so having having club members to share it with on a regular basis is a really fun thing to do. And we've talked about hey, Steve, the, um, the Sorry to interrupt, but uh, yeah. good question. I never thought of it. Is there any distinction between a flying club and a glider club? Or is there's, it still a club? Yeah, well, there's a bit of a difference, actually, and it's a bit subtle. But, um, you, you know, we were talking about flying clubs um, behaving themselves and not having the learn to fly sign and so on. That That is absolutely true in the case of uh, clubs operating from public publicly funded airfields, most of them. Airfields such as Frederick, for example, that have taken uh, that have taken federal funds for improvements and so on. Glider clubs generally operate from private grass strips, so a lot of those rules don't necessarily apply. And when you think about it, there there are very few um, glider schools on hard surface public uh, publicly funded airports. Most of them are grass strips out in the boonies because it's that's that's nice. You can you can sort of um, do what you like there. So, so there is there is a difference, and they are then held to they're not held to the same standards of of uh, not advertising for membership, not holding out, not not uh, having the learn to fly sign on there. But that's primarily because they are operating from uh, from private airfields. Okay. Wow, well, that was good. That was a good question then. Very yeah, nice. That was an excellent question. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about some of the benefits. You know, what's in it for me if I if I join a flying club? And the, just like Steve said, that they are an aviation themed social club. So there is a tremendous uh, support network there of like minded people. Instantly, you don't have to you know seek out people. They're they're all right there, and you you talk to them on a regular basis. So this this is really makes clubs a great landing spot for rusty pilots. You know, you you get checked out, you get recurrent with a flight instructor, and then you're you're basically let out into the world, right, to go flying. Well. It's nice to have a, a fellow club member that go flying with you. You know, you can bounce questions off of, you can help each other regain proficiency, not just currency. 
And uh, another nice thing is the aircraft and flying clubs are usually kind of tuned and upgraded and modified to the mission of that flying club. So you're, you'll see some stuff in there that you wouldn't typically see in, a, in like a flight school rental, for example. Another nice thing is the uh, multi-day use of airplanes for camping trips and all that good stuff. Um, I've been in a flying club for three years now, and I used to uh, run from a, a local flight school. I had to book a weekend three months in advance. And when you're a VFR only pilot, and the weather's bad for that weekend that you've been looking forward to for three months, it hurts. So <laughs> having a, having more uh, uh, kind of like a relaxed scheduling that you typically see in a flying club is really nice. And also too, because uh, flying clubs don't have a profit motive, there's usually, uh, it's very rare to see a daily minimum of hours that you have to fly each day that you have a, a club airplane out in the field. Um, this, is a, this is a big one and one that I did not even expect when I joined a flying club, but it's it's basically like a low risk way to, to learn about what it takes to own and operate an airplane. It's ownership light. When you're sharing a club with 10 people, that's a 10th of the cost that you're, that you're expelling. So if you have like a, if you have a really expensive annual or something or something, something breaks in the plane or you, you do an upgrade that causes more problems than actually helps, helps you, uh, it's, it doesn't hurt as much. And you have all this, again, that camaraderie and all that experience of your fellow club members to help you Kind of help you along and, and you can you can learn and grow from it um, is there, uh, do, do you guys have some kind of guideline or, or something about maybe the number of people or the optimum number of members for a flying club yeah definitely it, it's it varies for for each club um there are a couple limiting factors that we'll talk about uh, one of which is insurance definitely you can't have 50 people all named on one insurance policy for one airplane it just I mean, it, you could, but it, it probably wouldn't be very effective. And plus, like, imagine trying to fly that thing. It would be, <laughs> everyone's trying to fly it. So my, my club, personally, we have one airplane and 16 members, and that, that works for us. Uh, Steve's club has five people in one airplane. Uh, it's just, it's a matter of the, the club mission and, and what your culture is, really. Um, so generally speaking, around, around 10 to 12 people per airplane is the general rule of thumb that we like to see. So... Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good question. We get that one quite a bit as well. Um, well. Also, you're you're drawing some attention as well as you know the excellent quality of this uh, presentation here. And somebody was wondering if you guys provide either uh, you will be allowing this presentation or these slides to be downloaded, or do you have something else that possibly you could share that someone could else download, someone else could download somewhere else to show with or share with their club? Yeah. Oh, yeah, boy, do we. We have something even better, actually, we, uh, and you'll, you'll see about this in a bit, but we have the guide to starting a flying club. So that's oh my on our website. We'll show you where yeah. that is. Um, oh, so I'm so but, excited for this slide. <laughs> Steve just reminded me of this, by the way. Rob Machado's private pilot handbook. Like, ah, there you have, oh, there, there you go. Um, so we we have guides. We have um, we'll show you some some shots of uh, of our website. Uh, we're really pleased with our new website. Actually, Drew did a really good job um, updating our website recently. So that's uh, that, that's really good. And we also do a lot of other presentations. We do presentations called Maximum Fun, Minimum Cost, How to Start and Run a Flying Club, the Benefits of a Flying Club. We do flying club workshops. So lots of material out there. Um, so uh, you know it's, it's all available online basically. Yeah. And, and plus, Steve and I are really good resources. You know, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. So we are we're very accessible to the public. If you have any questions about flying clubs, you can reach out to us. We're real people. We'll answer your calls. We'll answer your emails. We're happy yeah, we're to talk. Like a commercial. Commercial. You might, might have thought we were actors, but we're not. Yeah. Well, moving on to, with this uh, presentation brought to you by by Boeing and Four Flight. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about hey, some uh, of the. Uh, one other thing, actually, too, you mentioned aircraft, access to aircraft, insurance, sure. all this stuff about aircraft. Um, someone asked here, do you have to, does the club have to own an aircraft? Oh, we'll, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. It's a great it's question, a and question. we'll actually come to that in a bit, right, Drew? Okay. Yes. <laughs> cool. All right, why don't we go to the next slide right now, Steve? Let's, let's do it. Let's get into well, it. Just, I, I mean, just talk about that last bullet point there. I think that's important. Yeah, sure. So, um, so when you think about it, right, so flying clubs, there's 10 or 12 people flying one airplane, as opposed to one individual owner flying their airplane by themselves, right? So that means that flying clubs have a natural, they're a natural kind of gateway to the community. They they have a, a really good opportunity to invite people across the fence and bring them into the airport. So uh, it's it's just a great way to to kind of be a good neighbor and, and show how great uh, aviation can be to, to the people around your airport. So. Uh, that's that's really good to see. Um, and then lastly, that last bullet 
because there's no profit motive and and also uh, flying clubs typically operate off of tack time instead of Hobbs time, you're seeing a, a much more affordable hourly flying rate. So it, it, it makes sense. If you want to fly a lot, flying clubs are the way to go. So do clubs have to own their own aircraft? <laughs> That's time. <laughs> That was tiny. It's almost like we knew it was coming. Oh, you amazing. The flight the it's amazing. There's a magic to this. There's a yeah, science. Yeah, there is. Yeah. <laughs> There's a madness. Is that what you said? A madness? To yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so there are two main ownership models, uh, if you like, for, for flying clubs. The first one is called a, a, an equity club. And this is where club members are also aircraft co-owners. People have shares in the airplane. So they join the club, they pay a certain amount of money to join the club, they also pay a certain amount of money for their share, and that's it. It's not, I mean, they don't own the, the trim tab or the elevator, they own you know, a, a percentage part of, of the aeroplane. Um, um, but that, that, has, that is an equity stake, um, it, it has value. Everyone should really own the, share, the same share, there shouldn't be any idea of somebody having two shares, somebody having one share, somebody having five shares, because then, you know, some people think they're more important, they want more votes, and they want more, more say in how the club is run, and, you know, it should be one person, one vote. Then the, no, the non-equity or no-equity club, this is where the club leases uh, an aeroplane. The lease has to be exclusive, it's leased from an owner, the owner may or may not be a club member. Um, the, the exclusivity there is important because you can't just sort of have an airplane in a flying club and the owner comes along and decides to use it on a weekend when somebody else has it has it dispatched or somebody else has it booked. So the only way that the owner can actually fly their own airplane is as an equal member of the club. And this is a requirement of uh, flying clubs that operate um, with leased airplanes. And of course, it makes a bunch of sense to have uh, a, a good lease agreement in place to make sure everyone knows is it the owner, owner or is it the club that's responsible for particular types of, of maintenance? And hey, once Steve, again, how, how does that work, though, with um, and gosh, maybe it's coming up, but like with the insurance policy itself. So you're talking about maintenance stuff. But what if there is an accident of some kind who, you know, can all of the members be responsible or is it the one entity that had the accident? Well, that, that's that's a respect. That's sort of outside of whether it's an equity club or non-equity club, but the, it's a good okay. question, what, what happens about insurance? Um, okay. Certainly a, a flying club most, most definitely should carry insurance. It absolutely should carry liability insurance for third party claims and liability claims. Um, but most clubs will also carry hull insurance as well. And that becomes part of the fixed costs of, uh, of, of the club, of operating the club. Um, some clubs do require that every member has uh, their own uh, additional insurance. Most clubs don't, to be honest. The club looks after insurance on behalf of uh, of its members. Right. And by the way, Pat, by doing that, it becomes a lot cheaper, even though the, the policy is way more expensive than the, the policy for a single, a single owner. When you divide it by 10 or 12, the number of people in the club, it's always a lot cheaper than uh, just doing it yourself. Which uh, actually, since we got to insurance, sorry for kind of sidetracking, but someone asked way early on uh, about maybe age and they were just curious because they said they're 79 flying basic med and uh, he's finding that no club or FBO is willing to rent him an aircraft because the insurance carriers will not cover solo flying for pilots 75 or over. Is this something you've seen? Yeah, it's an increasing an increasing problem. Um, this last couple of years have been quite challenging with that with aviation insurance for for a number of different reasons. Um, and uh, you know, insurance companies will always look at, at risk and they base their risk on, on data. Um, unfortunately, they don't they're not very open in sharing that data with us. Because we'd <laughs> like to to counter it with our data as well, particularly from organisations such as ASI, the uh, the uh, Air Safety Institute. Um, but but it is one of those things, and and I, you know, I think I think we have to be realistic about this as well. Uh, I mean, as you get older, you know, we all slow down, and some people do, and uh, the, <laughs> um, you, you know, the, the the sort of if you think about it from a risk perspective, it increases. Would you be too put out if you had to pay a little bit more for your auto insurance because you're older? Well, probably not. Uh, life insurance? Well, probably not. Um, and yet we all seem to think that aviation insurance is somehow different. But, but I, think, I think the insurance companies can help themselves a lot more. Um, over the last couple of years, we've seen situations where clubs just don't 
they just don't insure people not just sort of putting up the premiums to to give the same message but they say that you, you, we're just not going to insure you quite often not always when we dig into situations like that we'll find that there's other reasons behind it not just age but we we in AOPA are working really hard with uh, with the underwriters to make sure that, um, that that the data is correct and we're not just discriminating people based on a number you know 78 it's okay 79 nee, no I mean it doesn't make any sense also with yeah. basic med it's just it's just not older people who use basic med you know young pilots use basic meds as well there's no age the requirement for basic med. Uh, we've also seen some uh, situations with um, experimental and light sport where you know the, the insurance companies just don't have good enough data. So yes, we're working on it, um, but without doubt, it, it, as you get older, it's going to be more difficult to get insurance. And just to piggyback, one more thing on that too, um, how your club is structured, either equity or non-equity, will determine how you get insurance as well. Some some companies have opinions on equity or non-equity clubs over equity clubs. So make sure that you're looking at all the options when you're thinking about how you're going to structure your club. That's my advice there. Yeah. All right. Well, so speaking of airplanes and ownership and all that fun stuff, let's talk about what type of airplanes clubs operate. What do you guys think? I think so, because actually I know we've got some questions about that. Um, yes, we do. I'll save question, it. Too, but yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cool. So the, the, the gist of it is that clubs operate pretty much any type of airplane. A large majority, I, I mean, probably over 95% operate piston single airplanes. There's, there's a very small minority of clubs that operate multi-engine or anything other, any other fancy exotic thing out there. So uh, typically the club just decides and votes on uh, what kind of airplane they want to fly, what, what their mission is, what their culture is, and, that, and they, they find an airplane that fits that, that need. Um, it's really easy to get carried away. Um, it, it, without fail, we get people asking about forming a helicopter club, and we've, we, I haven't seen anyone be uh, successful in doing so. I wish, I wish it could happen, but generally the, the insurance question becomes the, the limiting factor there, unfortunately. But hey, we're... We're, we'll uh, we'll try any, try anything. We're willing to help you out with anything. Um, and so generally speaking, most clubs end up operating a an airplane that has a good compromise. It it does everything pretty well. It's not it's not super fast. It won't go super far. But it 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 you know it's it's good for the hundred dollar hamburger or the flight across country. So a lot of clubs as as their first airplane, especially have a Cessna 172 or the Piper Cherokee. Um, generally speaking, the second or third airplane has a different mission, a different role. It's either a, a tail dragger or an aerobatic airplane or a, a go fast, go far airplane, like your, like your Sirius, your Bonanzas and things like that. So, um, and we're seeing at, w w the airplane market right now, as you guys probably know, it's crazy. So we're seeing clubs look at different alternatives as opposed to just the regular 172 and Piper Cherokee, because those are getting, those are getting hard to find and they're getting expensive. So we're seeing clubs, including my own club, who's looking at buying the second airplane. We're, we're looking at, you know, different different things like your your Grumman Tigers, your Cirrus, and and all that stuff. There also are clubs that operate, you know, Warbirds. There's a, the Trojan Flyers. They're a bunch of kind of well-heeled, high-time pilots who operate T-28 Trojans, and that's that works for them. Um, there's also an, 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 a growing interest in the uh, the light sport uh, market as well with the RV-12. is is proving to be a very economical and easy to operate club airplane. Um, and then the the Cirrus, as the Cirrus fleet kind of ages a little bit, they're becoming a little bit more affordable. The, you know, you get yourself a uh, a parachute and a plastic airplane, go for it. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I, I may have offended people by saying that. I'm sorry. Pablo's a Cirrus guy, okay, so yes, Cirrus is fine. <laughs> but uh, remember, I didn't say. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Direct all your, direct seeing, all your questions to Drew. <laughs> yes, no, but it, it's it's interesting, right? So especially with flying clothes, when they when they transition from a, a your your typical you know your Cessnas or your Pipers or something like that, and they buy a a Cirrus or a Diamond, there are some growing pains because those they're maintaining and operating those airplanes is just different. So it's uh it's something that you need to think about, like how are your clubs, how will you operate it, and like you know what what parts of the airplane can you push on when you're trying to get the thing in and out of the hangar. You know that that type of stuff is is are questions that you really need to answer when you're when you're expanding your club's airplane. So yeah. it's a uh, you know there's a lot of, a lot of variables at play. And I think that just uh, I'll just make the comment here that I know one of the the folks asked, is it okay to offer dissimilar aircraft? 
glider tail, obviously that's exactly what you're saying. It's that you can have one where it's all the same aircraft. Maybe you want the efficiencies of the fleet or the other part is that's the attraction, right? Is being able to own several different types of aircraft. That's an advantage of a flying club. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, there's, there's obviously safety. I'm putting on my safety officer hat here. There are safety concerns. If you have a, a Piper and a Cessna in the same, in the same club, you got to make sure that you're training people properly on fuel management. If you have a, a tailwheel aircraft or something like that, you have to make sure that people are operating, you know, are, are maintaining enough proficiency to safely operate that, that tailwheel aircraft. So yeah, you can do it. It's just, it just takes more work and takes a lot of careful monitoring. Can you guys also hit on, we've had a question in here. There's a gentleman that is really interested in helicopters, but cannot seem to find a helicopter club. I know that you guys get questions about this. Can mm -hmm. you address that? He just says, are there any out there? And what's the deal? Because I said, because helicopter guys need friends too. Literally. What oh said. yeah. You want to take this one, Steve? Yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll take okay. it. Um, I mean, over the years, I probably had a good, good half a dozen, if not more people call in and saying, really interested in setting up a helicopter club. And uh, because I can't find one, right? I can't find a flying club, a helicopter flying club, so I'd like to set one up. Um, and, and we'll work really hard with those folks to do that. The the the, the big problems, I mean, it, it comes down to money. Uh, the, the 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 acquisition cost of a helicopter is large, so you're generally restricting the number of people who might want to be in that club. Generally, clubs, of course, are very close to geographically. Members live close to the airport, so finding people who fly helicopters and have the money to say purchase or, or, or co-purchase a helicopter, that becomes a challenge and that sort of limits the, the, the natural growth. The big thing that we found is we just cannot get any traction on um, insurance for, for helicopters in, and, 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 and uh, members of a flying club with helicopters. It, they just don't seem to exist. So it is possible, it just has some challenges to it. And I want to add one thing to that too. So you mentioned that helicopter pilots need friends. We do see a lot of pilot associations out there, just like just like AOPA. But there are there are regional, local, you know, pilot groups. There's no they don't own an aircraft, but they they are a social organization that that you know share the love of flying together. So that that could be an option for them as well. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think the the other option there for for helicopter folks would be perhaps to go into some sort of co-ownership. Um, you know, without going the full club route, because that's where the insurance becomes a problem. If it's just two or three people, they get their own insurance. Um, they share the cost of operating the helicopter. So that's that might be the best way forward for that. Steve, while you make that point really quick, and you just also touch on somebody asked, what's the difference between co-owning between four to five people and a club? So why the difference? Why choose a club over that? Yeah. So the um, you know, typically the the co-ownership with four or five people. Um, the, 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 the social side of it is not typically there. Uh, as I mentioned, a, a club is very much a social club. It's set up as a social club. It's set up as a non-profit social organization, whereas most co-ownerships are, are LLCs. And that in itself doesn't prevent people from, from, from mingling, co-mingling and, and, uh, you know, and, and having social interactions. But it's just generally the nature of the beast. I think the other, the other, one of the other main differences is, is uh, in terms of the funding. In a co-ownership, it's what I call just-in-time payment. Something goes wrong, everyone's assessed. There's sort of no no real notion of paying monthly dues, which allows reserves to be accumulated over time. Um, so that can have a, a really big impact as well on individuals within co-ownerships. So this is very exciting. Uh, your next slide, I'm just I'm dying for us to get there uh, because. I think all of the questions relate to this part of it that are remaining. These are, so. these are great questions so far, I gotta say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so how are flying clubs run? Hopefully very well. Um, we, we know two that are <laughs> run exceptionally well, right, Drew? That's right. Uh, I mean, the, 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 sort of, the really important thing here is, de is democratically. Um, it really is a, a club of equals. And I think some clubs get into trouble, particularly if the same board of directors has been in the club you know, for 30 years and it becomes more, it, it's more just a group of, 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 of there's sort of two sets of, of, of standards, I suppose, the people who run the club and the people who are just members, whereas, whereas everyone really needs to be a member and enjoy, enjoy themselves for that. We've talked about this idea of clubs should not solicit for membership based on learn to fly with us. I think this is really important. And this is a, an area which is sort of addresses a question that you, you asked me 
um, through text, uh, Pablo, about relationships with clubs and FBOs and things like that. This is one of the areas where flying clubs can cross the line. And it, it doesn't happen maliciously. It's just maybe a new board comes in. Um, perhaps there's a new webmaster and everyone gets all excited. Hey, we can we can go and uh, solicit for membership because, wait, we have an airplane. People want to learn to fly. Why don't we charge $99 for introductory rides? And it, it, everyone sort of gets carried away with this idea of trying to market the, the flying club to particularly to non-flyers. And as we talked about earlier, that's just not right. It's not fair. It's not legal. Um, but if clubs do go down that path, you could certainly see where tensions would occur between FBOs, who are legitimate uh, commercial services providers, same with flight schools, um, and flying clubs. So we we actually spend quite a lot of our time, uh, we, we produce a document called Standards, Values and Best Practices for Flying Clubs. We're, we're not the flying club's police, we're not going to report anyone. Um, but we we often have conversations with flying clubs just to say, hey, do you know that this this document here on the federal register says you shall not act like a flight school. You shall not ho hold out to the public. And most times clubs are horrified to learn that they've crossed the line and they'll change their website and they'll change their operations. Um, so so I, I understand that tensions can exist, but it's usually because somebody's not following the rules. One 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 of the other parties is not following the rules. So based on that, though, Steve, sorry, um, if you're not soliciting for membership, how do you get a new member? Well, I, I, I mean, this is my personal opinion. I, I firmly believe that flying clubs are places for existing pilots to, to stay as existing pilots and to, to stay proficient. Um, you know, we have professional flight schools. They're eking out a, a high, high risk, low margin business. Um, and they're the professional trainers. Let's leave training to them. But why not set up a relationship with the flight school? We'll refer people to you. People who come to us, the club, and say, hey, we'd like to learn to fly. And say, well, you know, we don't teach people to fly, but why don't you go and uh, have a chat with the, the, the local flight school? And then once they've achieved their, uh, their, their, their private pilot's license, um, send them back over to us and we'd love to consider them to be a member of the club. That's another distinction, I think. I mean, flight schools generally generally will take anyone, right? If, if somebody wants to learn to fly, they'll they'll work with them and, and hopefully teach them to fly. Flying clubs don't have to take somebody just because they've, they've uh, applied to the club. And that's what I think makes the, the sort of the culture of a club. You, you need to make sure that, that people are of the same sort of thought process. Um, some clubs uh, limit themselves to particular professions, the flying doctors, the flying particles, the, the whatever, uh, to sort of keep that camaraderie and culture intact. Um, so the point there is just because somebody comes with a, a check to join the club doesn't mean that you 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 have to, uh, to, to take them on as a member. There's, there's, in fact, Drew's club has a very sophisticated um, membership um, interview process to make sure that uh, the right people are coming into the club for the right reasons. On that topic, that's the club's responsibility now to make sure that somebody's not just trying to join the club in order to beat up the airplane, learn to fly, and then leave the club after six months. That's that's part of this, I think, responsibility. Cool. So, so I just wanted to remind us a little bit that we only have 12 minutes left. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we, we want to get to questions and we usually stick around for about you know 15, 20 minutes after the hour has passed, but just so that we make sure we get all of your content in. So because it's good so far, we love it. Great. Yeah. So, um, you know, you're talking about you're talking about a club, which is a group of people. And because it's a group of people, anything and everything can happen. <laughs> it's human nature that things go sideways at different times. So it's it's really important to have the rules written down um, beforehand, either in bylaws, which is sort of the governance rules. This is how the club will be run, but also the operating rules. You know, who, who's responsible for wiping the bugs off the windscreen? Generally, clubs clubs don't have people to do that. Clubs don't employ line people to do those that sort of thing. Um, so it's up to it's up to every club member to make sure they leave the airplane better than they they found it. So having those rules written down. What if you mentioned this earlier with um, with the insurance question? What if somebody dings the airplane? Or rather than try to have that discussion after the fact, why not put that into the bylaws? So when people join the club, they know exactly what they're joining. They know exactly what they're signing up for. Um, and that's, this has become quite an issue because if a club makes a claim because of you know some hangar rash or something, um, then we're seeing that, that, I mean, that claim, of course, means that 
um, the, their insurance policy is going to go up the, the next year and probably for the next three to five years, who pays for the increase in policy? It, would it be worth uh, the club just, you know, not making a claim and uh, having the the, uh, the the person who caused the damage pick up the pick, pick up the tab? And that's something that needs to be discussed and put into the bylaws well before it happens. Um, hold monthly meetings. It's, it's meant to be a social club. It's a social club with aeroplanes, right? <laughs> and that's again one of the big differences between, I think, a co-ownership. Um, there is ex there is an expected part, but, and, and if you've if you've filed and successfully obtained tax exemption from the IRS, you are expected to quote commingle. They love that word. The IRS <laughs> loves the word commingle. Uh, it's, written right in, it's, it's written in their documents. In fact, you know, flying club uh, club members should commingle. Uh, so, so uh, the, the idea is that you do get together, that you you enjoy the social aspects of it, and as part of that, there's sort of an expectation that you give something back to the community, and I think that's a responsibility for flying clubs as well. Keep a keep an agenda and minutes, usually required by the state if you're set up as a corporation, and of course keep very good books. Um, clubs can be and are audited, and club books should be absolutely transparent to to all club members. Um, we often ask, do non-profit flying clubs have to file reports and tax returns? Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. Uh, many, as I said, can file for tax exemption, but you still have to file reports, annual reports and, uh, and various other things, uh, both at the state level and at the federal level. Cool. So let's uh, let's talk about the uh, the money of it, right? How much is it actually going to cost you to be a member of a flying club and, and how, do the, how does the club cover its expenses? So, the, we have two things there, the fixed costs and the variable costs. The fixed costs are things that the club has to pay even if they don't fly a single hour that entire month. These are all the, the, the ground fees basically, right? So you got your insurance, your your hangar, your tie down, how the, 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 the fee for the annual and all the expenses related to that and your database updates, all that good stuff. Those go into your monthly dues and um, that, that's determining you know, how much each month you're, you're paying. The variable costs then, uh, cover the per hour usage rate. So you have your fuel. A lot of clubs do a wet rate, which includes the fuel. Um, there are clubs out there that do dry rates as well. It's it's up to you. We we generally recommend that you do a wet rate. Um, and then you have your consumables, your oil. Um, you, this is where you also put in your maintenance funds. So you're uh, putting money away to do overhauls and potentially upgrades. And uh, that that's where the engine and prop come from kind of comes into, and that turns into your hourly rate. Um, we get a lot of questions about how to set these. Um, the, the monthly dues are easy. You just take all your costs and, and divide them amongst the members, and that's that. The hourly rate, there's usually a lot of the, uh, information out there um, from other owners of how much it, it costs to operate your particular airframe. And you can kind of build it off of that and then add some more, um, add some wiggle room for your uh, upgrades and overhaul funds as well. So that's that's uh, pretty much how you can, can you get you can get close that way. And, and naturally, when you start a club out from scratch, you know you, you're going to have some some growing pains and some things that that pop up. So be, be prepared to you may have to you may get close, but you may have to adjust your rates a little bit. Um, and another big one, Steve, I know is the uh, the insurance question. This this really kind of reared its head last year, and we're seeing we're seeing more of it this year. Although we're seeing some uh, some lightening up. Uh, but it really, the, the hardening of the insurance market that we saw last year really made us ask a lot of questions about, you know, well, what, what can clubs do to keep their insurance cheap? What can the owners and, and pilots do to keep the insurance rates lower? Do you want to talk about that, Steve? Um, yeah, so this is, it's really proficiency. Um, you know, when, when you look at, when you analyze the claims, it's not these one-off really big uh, accidents, which, which can cost, of course, millions and millions in liability and so on. Um, it's the constant draw of, of claims of, of people taxiing into other aeroplanes when they're fiddling around with their GPS um, or, you know, the gear up landings or, or just sort of prop strikes in general. When you look at the amount of money that that uh, flying, that um, insurance companies pay out on claims for those sorts of things, it's huge. And that's something that we can help. And this is where proficiency training comes in. So. Uh, Drew and I, um, you know, as part of our flying club work, introduced this whole notion of wings for clubs, how you can use the FAA wings proficiency program within a club. And it can make a big difference. My club did it last year and we saw a 20 percent reduction in our insurance policy. So um, just so you guys know, we're just we're running close to the, the hour here. Yeah. Um, I know that you've got all 
pretty much a lot more, even more of this information on the website, correct? And I know we're going to show that here momentarily. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to think we'll, that. I think we've we'll got some to, we'll uh, lots of questions. That, right. So let's. let's yeah. Go. Okay. Cool. 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 So, so what do we do? Well, we help clubs get started. You know, the, the, Drew and I, in terms of our you know, professional work, uh, we work with existing clubs to help with strategic planning, legal help by pilot protection services, and so on. Um, you may be surprised, but there are disputes with members. There are disputes with, uh, with yeah. airports, so we we help with that. And we also try it's to always wiped it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a website. We have these uh, these guides that that we do here. Here are two typical ones. We're always writing various documents, like um, you know, what what about the 100 hour question for flying clubs, or you know, um, what about how, how do you add another club aircraft? How do you go about that process? So we do a lot of work with all of that. Um, we do also other things. We have the Club Connector newsletter, uh, which um, which publishes every third Sunday of the month. Sign up for that. You can go uh, AOPA Flying Clubs Club Connector. We do webinars and seminars like this one, but also very exclusively for 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 individual clubs. We'll help individual clubs um, with a marketing campaign by by reaching out to to people within the general area. We have a Facebook page. We have Flying Clubs Radio, which I know you'll just <laughs> love. Um, and we also ben, run a survey. Highly recommended. <laughs> uh, we also run a survey so we can get the pulse. Um, and if you need more, well, you can always call us, uh, email us, or look on our website. Yeah. So we uh, just we just rolled out our new website. Really proud of this. Um, a lot of resources, a lot of information on there. Uh, if you haven't been to AOPA.org in the Flying Club section, I really recommend you check it out. There's there's some cool there's stuff. There's a couple things we can discuss later, Drew, but yeah, it looks pretty good. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, What's real the quick, URL for that, by the way? What's the URL for the website? Uh, Is it a, a good question. Like a... We, we just, uh, it just changed. So we, we, we've been making some okay. changes on where the website's hosted, so. The, can, the easiest thing yeah. to do is to type in AOPA Flying Clubs and it will pop up. Yeah. Cool. So we've had there a couple of questions as to I live in, is there a club or what is the best way? Yeah. Uh, so what would you say your flying club finder, go there please, camera two, AOPA flying club finder. Um, <laughs> what, what, how do you get into it? Who's in it? How complete is it? Camera two, please. Yeah, great. So that's, that's, that's a, that's a great question. Bottom, bottom of the screen there on the right hand side, that is our flying club finder. You can search by airport, you can search by state, you can search by by city, basically, and that is a uh, up to date. We, we we do our we work really hard actually to keep that database up to date and make sure that people who are listing their club on there are we can actually get a hold of them and they are responsive. So that has all of the all of our AOPA network flying clubs, which are clubs that are active and are, are abiding by the the you know the standards and values and best practices that that we think are best for flying clubs. We also have clubs in formation. So if you are working on forming a club, you can advertise it with our flying club finder and find potential members. Uh, we also we also uh, have glider clubs. There's also some hot air balloon clubs, believe it or not. And there's also you know, those pilot associations that we talked about that maybe don't have an airplane, but they're, they're social organizations. So those are all listed and can be found in our flying club finder. And cool. part of our new updated website, we have a lot more uh, searchability for the type of aircraft, the type of flying that clubs do. So if you want to search all the tailwheel clubs in the United States, you, you'll be able to search that. So uh, check cool. it out, play around with it. Um, that's a really good resource to find clubs in your area. Nice. So um, one thing, speaking of, uh, oh, by the way, I do want to see an airship club. So if somebody out there is willing to do it, I'd, I'd love to, just just for the fun of it. Got to have a blimp. But uh, yeah. for the... For the um, one of the questions that's come up a couple of times is that you know we've talked about the fact that that uh, clubs can't hold out they can't advertise to uh, to learn to fly but then some folks are asking well does that mean that it's not okay for me to get a rating in the club aircraft if I'm a member like maybe I've got my private I want to get my instrument would you guys address that yeah absolutely there's there's actually nothing that says um, a, a person could could not join a flying club as a student pilot, and, and if the club bylaws allow it to to use that club aircraft for the purposes of of, of obtaining a private pilot's license, I, I think our, our our caution there is if you're at a club with ten people and nine of them are student pilots, it's one of them's a CFI, it starts looking really like a flight school very very quickly. So sort of mo moderating and monitoring that. Um, the other side of it is, remember, flying clubs, members are equally responsible for the airplane, whether they own it or whether they lease it. 
So a lot of flying clubs do not permit primary training just because of the extra wear and tear and maintenance that everyone has to share in. Essentially, every every club member is subsidizing a student pilot. And when you think about it like that, um, but that really de that's that uh, that depends upon the individual club. Um, most clubs will certainly uh, will certainly want their club aircraft to be used for proficiency and for for advanced training, which leads to better proficiency. So it's absolutely it's certainly not unusual for people um, to use the club aircraft. My aircraft, for example, we have two P two of the members at the moment using the bat uh, for their uh, instrument training, and that that's a great way to to do that. Um, so we we when we talk about you know flight training and the whole holding out, that's mostly targeted at at people, you know, new, new pilots, uh, primary training, uh, rather than the the benefits that you can have in a flying club for, for proficiency and advanced training. And so one thing I like to mention, because I know that I would be at air shows and, and people would come up and they would start pitching an idea. And it's all because of the fact that they're trying to help folks out. And so what they're, they're talking about is they say, you know, we just want to create a place for kids to fly. We want to do it at, you know, we're all willing to donate our time, that sort of stuff. And they want to set up a flying club. But oftentimes, there, I don't know, a lot of people don't seem to know, but there is an entity as a nonprofit flight school. So you're yes. meeting the minimum standards of the airport. You're being a good neighbor. You can hold out. You can advertise. But then you're also doing it at no cost. Like, in other words, the CFIs are volunteering their time and that sort of thing. So you can do that sort of, and I'm, I'm sort of a philanthropical. I'm not, not getting quite the word that I wanted. But um, the idea is you can do that to provide that low-cost flight training but you can do it under a different form. So if you have any questions about that, um, you know, feel free to contact us there as well. Yeah, we also get we also get people call us and say, I, you know, I'm, I'm in a position in my life and my career. I'd like to give back. I'd like to start a flying club, or I'd like to, I'd like to own a flying club. And and so you know, we sort of steer people away from the idea of owning a flying club. Yeah. But starting a flying club with just the sole purpose of teaching kids to fly is a wonderful idea. We don't want to burst people's bubbles, but there's another way of doing it set up a set up a foundation bring money in get 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 sponsorship get money coming in set up some scholarships um, allow people to learn to fly with the local flight school and then bring those people back into a fully fledged flying club to keep them flying there are ways of doing it now there was an interesting question in here that i saw and it really i was like i've never heard that one because we've talked about you guys have mentioned that an owner can lease an aircraft to the club i mean even a potentially a flight school could have an airplane and own it and then lease it to the club for their use but this one was we have a club that's not fully utilizing the airplane they wanted to know if they could lease it back to a school is that okay no unfortunately not remember that the, the club is for members only and the equipment is for members only so you can't do it that way the, the other way where the idea of a of a school realizes that they want to keep people proficient you know it's the idea of keeping customers rather than developing new ones all the time uh, we've talked a lot about the idea of flight schools setting up affiliated clubs they have to be separate legal organizations but just affiliated clubs and perhaps they lease one of their airplanes from the fleet exclusively for the club to keep people flying and keep them proficient so would this put us into the qa officially yes okay. was that a question was that a question uh <laughs> Actually, uh, anyway, yeah. let's if we could let's hit what's coming up next month and then we'll continue yeah. with the qa if we awesome. go to that slide it's uh yeah, a oh, couple ahead right. there, I believe, Steve. So, as we begin our second year of syndication, no, just kidding. If we, as we begin our second year of webinar stardom, fandom, and just all around knowledge, uh, we start May thirteenth of next of of next year of uh, next month. So, uh, same time, same bad channel. That'd be twelve eleven central. Uh, technically, tech, comma savvy, savvy. <laughs> it's a question yet a statement all in one <laughs> so uh let's begin the qa steve drew we have many questions so put on your hats you got 15 minutes we're gonna answer all of these very good on. by the way go okay <laughs> the first one will take us into the whole realm of okay i want to find one what are the top three things to look out for or watch out for when selecting a flying club that's that's a really good question, and I'm going to direct you to one of our resources. Steve and I actually oh. recorded a Flying Club's radio episode all about this. It's called Episode 12, Pre-Flighting a Flying Club. So it's, it covers the questions to ask, what some red flags are, what to look for. 
And it really, it's, it's just like any, any organization, you want them to be organized, you want them to be re, um, responsive to, to your questions and open about things. Um, but you know, it's like anything, you get a feel for it. Um, and if it, if it feels good, it feels like people that you're, well, you can spend a lot of time with and work with, then that's, that's a really good sign. But yeah, check out Flying Clubs Radio, um, pre-flighting your flying club. There's some, some really and good stuff. And where would we find stuff. Flying Clubs Radio? Yeah. That would be on the, the AOPA Flying Clubs website. We are up to episode, we're up to 16 episodes of Flying Club Radio. Wow. So, which was the like episode you mentioned? Uh, I believe it's episode 12. Let me uh, let me verify that. I was going to be impressed Fantastic. if you had that now. That's pretty good. So. Well, I, I just I just uh, emailed it off to someone, so that's part <laughs> of it. <laughs> you don't admit that. We're professionals. It's like we know this. Like yeah. Oh, it yeah. is. It, oh, look at that. It's episode 12. So, yeah, fantastic. Okay, yeah. All right, all right. So uh, this is a question I think that's probably very open-ended, which is someone says that they feel that there's a high average initial cost to joining a flying club. So I guess the question here, because that's what it says, the question would be like, do you agree? If so, and if not, what you know, what are the possible differences in such a you know someone feels it's a high cost? So there, there are different component costs, as Drew mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of fixed costs and variable costs, but there's this other one, which is how much does it cost to join? And it's like, how much does it cost to join a gym? Well, it depends. Uh, if you're joining a closed membership group, such as a gym or uh, a quilting club, or, or oh gosh, a curling club where, with sort of limited numbers, then what you're doing by having limited numbers, you're building value, right? The membership has a value and you should you should expect to pay for that. Um, so even clubs that don't uh, own their own aircraft, they're non-equity clubs, should charge a reasonable amount of money um, to to ensure that the right people want to join and 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 uh, and enter into the club. And I don't mean right in terms of you know being being able to pay for it, but it, but in terms of um, having skin in the game, feeling some financial um, in, involvement, some some investment in the club. So don't don't be too surprised that uh, that the joining fee may be very substantial, and you could argue that the more popular the club, perhaps the more the uh, the joining fee is going to be because of that exclusivity. Um, on the other hand, uh, many clubs try to keep their 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 entry costs low, particularly non-equity clubs, where then where you're not having to pay for that that uh, you know the equity share. But I would still caution that you you want to set it at such a level that people feel engaged in the club and it, that it's not particularly easy just to walk away from it. Otherwise, you just end up with a revolving door of of, of members, and that just doesn't drive the the social camaraderie or, or you know the, the whole culture of the club. Well, like you were saying, it's not special anymore. Right. I mean, what's the point if you just you know hey, who's that? I don't know. He just joined yesterday. There's a testimonial right here, too, that one person put out that said they joined a club. They did find that the, you know, the membership costs and other things were a little higher than they expected. Um, but they said that with all of that, that, the safety and community aspects of being a member more than I'll set the cost, even though they didn't feel like they were saving as much money. Those other aspects, like you said, they found value in that and found that it's something that was worthwhile to them. Can, can we send that guy a picture of Steven just as like a little, you know. <laughs> signed, signed picture. Yeah, yeah signed picture. One million right. subs, Drew. One million subs. <laughs> that's right. Sorry. Well, that's, so, that's good to hear. Um, yeah. All right. In a one aircraft club, who would be the ownership entity? Well, so um, if the club owns the aircraft, the aircraft will be um, registered in the name of the club. And essentially all members are members of the club and share in the 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 uh, equity of the uh, of the airplane some clubs do it a little bit differently they may list every club member on the registration that gets tiresome if people do leave and, and when people join so usually the airplane is vested and registered in the name of the club hmm. excellent okay next what if a member wants to quit how do they get their money back this is probably specific to how it's set up, right? Yeah. This, this, this one just drives me crazy. Why, why, why do you expect to get money back? I mean, I understand if there's an equity share, <laughs> right? If you've got if you've got ten thousand dollars and and you you share with ten other people in a one hundred thousand dollar airplane, um, that there's 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 a 
there's there's equity share but you bought into it it's like it's like saying well i'm just going to go buy a bonanza and six months later i decide i don't like it so i try and get my money back from the person who sold it to me right it, it it's not that type of organization and I, I would strongly suggest you do not join a flying club in, in any form of, of thinking it's an investment the idea is that over the long term you have access to nice airplanes as nice as you'd like them at really affordable costs and you end up flying more rather than saving money. Um, some clubs get themselves into all sorts of trouble by promising to refund the membership fees. Well, try that with your gym or even worse with your quilting club. I mean, that's not gonna happen. Um, so, and, and the, the, the big problem for the treasurer is you know if 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 people if people are promising to pay back and pick a number five hundred dollars refund five hundred dollars membership fee and there's ten members they need to be keeping five five hundred times ten as a liability on their books that they can't use for for actual you know working capital within the club um, and once again we have uh, we have a document on this it's on our website under downloadable resources and it's called it talks about the value. Uh, of club membership and people leaving and joining a, a club, but but I, I I feel quite strongly that if you join a club, it's just like joining a gym. You have obligations. Don't expect to get money back. Okay, fair point. Uh, and you're not going to get stronger. Okay, <laughs> your your uh, fines go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Does your website Club Finder allow partnerships to be listed? We have turnover occasionally, and finding someone new is just as hard as it is for a for clubs, not quite sure what they are here, but that's the question. Um, should I take that one, Drew? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, at, that, at the moment, no. Um, it is a flying club finder. Um, the other reason that we've resisted it for now is it, it, it. We don't want the flying club finder to become like a marketplace uh, for 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 people selling and and buying shares in in airplanes and and so on. It's it's very very different. Um, we do work with a, lo a lot of uh, co-ownerships. If you'd like to talk to us about setting up a co-ownership, we have our new guide to aircraft co-ownership, which um, pretty much says it all. Um, but we don't currently include co-ownerships uh, on the Flying Club Finder. In fact, I would say most co-ownerships don't want to be listed because they don't want people continuously calling them up saying, hey, is there a share available? Is there a share available? Is there a share available? So mm -hmm. we, we, we're just listening to, to, to public opinion there, really. So I think this, this one goes to your bylaws, perhaps. But uh, someone says, Thomas actually says, is it majority rules if, for instance, someone wants to do $30,000 avionics upgrade and some don't? <laughs> Drew, that's right up your alley right now, Oh, eh? man. Yeah, uh, my, my club is going through a lot of this stuff right now. So it, it really is. You, you want people to be not just – you don't want to compromise. You want everyone to be in an agreement. You want everyone to be happy with, with the direction the club is going. So that – it can be difficult. Um, and the, the problem is when you have – 16 people in your club you have 16 opinions so typically how we recommend people approach that is you, you form a committee that does the research figures out what the what the dollars and cents are going to be and then you report to the club and then the club will then decide and, and move forward from, uh, with that so it's it, it it can be difficult but it's it's worth the effort as an aside to that um because yeah i mean it, it has to be majority it can't it can't be uh, it, it can't just be um, you know, unanimous, right? You, you have to go with the flow. It's a democratic process. Does that mean some people might leave in a huff? Yes, but it also means you might have a different type of airplane now to attract new membership. Sounds good. Point. One uh, tip I saw in here, I'm just kind of curious to get, get your guys' uh, opinion on it, is it says that they asked everybody to recommend that before joining a club, it's a good idea to speak with past members and find out why they're no longer members. Do you guys agree with that or find that useful? looks like a yes yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, absolutely remember of course you can always get the disgruntled member um right. so you, you have to you have to sort of lace the opinions that you get with the with the situation um, but, but on the other hand i would also say don't get upset if the club wants to do a background check or a financial check on you I mean, they're, they're then treating it seriously they want to have good members and they want to have members who support the club um, and also will be in a financial position to keep uh, keep being a, a paid up member. So it, it sort of works both ways. 
Okay, um, here's one from Craig. I like this. Can a public airport refuse to allow a club to operate? Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, probably yes. <laughs> they 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 could certainly try it. Um, depending upon the circumstance, if, if there's no other flying club, if there's no other reason other than the airport just doesn't like it, or perhaps an FBO has complained, um, there is case for appeal most certainly there, um, and, and appeals like that can happen. Our, our government affairs group at AOPA work a lot with situations like that. Um, this comes under this, this notion of the grant assurances. If an airport has taken federal funding, then the airport should be available for uh, the, the public to use in the appropriate ways. And any sort of exclusion on it or exclusivity is, is not just allowed, it's actually illegal under the, 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 uh, the um, agreement that was put in place when the airport took that federal funding. Hey, there's a really interesting question here, and just I'm hoping you guys can help clarify because we've off, we've talked again that topic of not holding out, not advertising to learn to fly here. In other words, not behaving like a flight school. But this person was asking, well, then how can flying clubs get members if they're not allowed to advertise? So are they allowed to advertise other aspects of their club? Yeah, memberships available. Um, you know, come along, check us out. Inter uh, you can do the. Um, um, introductory meetings or, or some of those sorts of things, open meetings. What you don't want to say is, um, come along, come along, learn to, learn to fly with us, join as a member. Um, some clubs go even go even worse than that and say student members are half price. I mean, why would you pay somebody? Why would you charge somebody less money for beating up the airplane? It's sort of beyond me. Um, but it's that uh, some wording we've seen memberships available for pilots and non-pilots alike. You're not holding it out. You're just saying memberships are available. Yeah, yeah. So we, we see clubs advertise on the local you know bulletin board at the FBL all the time. I mean that's that's perfectly accept acceptable. Now accepting so real, members. Yeah. So the real key is it's the the the, the parts where you're going to get yourself into trouble is the learn to fly here because that's a flight school. You're a business in that case. And then the other part is like doing some sort of scenic rides or discovery flights. I mean, that's all the stuff where you're you're advertising that ability, but the rest of the stuff is well, okay. I think, well, I think the training, uh, a lot of these kind of training issues here, and, I, and there's many questions on, I think they're all just worded differently, but so a lot of people have asked, so what if we get a new airplane? You know, let's say we get a Cirrus, it's high performance. Do we have to go somewhere else to learn how to fly that plane so that we can now fly the plane within the club? And, and so it's like, you know. No. So that's 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 what I said. I think earlier the the learn to fly yeah. generally means learn to fly from scratch. Um, yes, student. Most, most definitely, we we would want and we would expect the club to put in place a transition training program. Yeah, absolutely. When bringing on another airplane, and we 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 wrote recently about that in uh, in the Club Connector newsletter. Okay, uh, if you start a club with an aircraft that you own. Are you essentially donating all but one of your shares to the other members, or is there a way to recoup some of your acquisition costs in exchange for shares in the club? Yeah, well, uh, you would if you own an aircraft, you would you could lease that airplane to the club, and the, the everything when you're when you lease an airplane, everything's on the table, so you can decide how much the club will pay the owner of the airplane for for the operation of the of the aircraft. You also decide who pays for maintenance, who pays for upgrades. Everything is negotiable then. And uh, some clubs start out as non-equity lease clubs, and then they do kind of a, a lease to own uh, situation where the club then will be in a position to buy the airplane from the owner and become an equity club or a, a wholly owned club. Steve's club, for example, is a is a non-equity. He, he owns his airplane and then leases it to a flying club. I think the other, the other angle of that may be also, I, I own an airplane, I'm going to form this thing called a club and other people are going to use it. Um, unless you're very careful, that's going to look like a rental operation. So again, the ownership aspects there, either the club's going to own the aircraft or the club exclusively leases the aircraft. There's, there's not really any room for somebody owning an airplane and um, then just renting it to friends in this sort of loose loose idea of a flying club. That that would be considered a rental organization with with all of the commercial ramifications that it would have. So, you know, the, the club really needs to own the aircraft or it needs to exclusively lease it. Okay, um, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, so someone says here that they actually own an airplane. They uh, fly from a private strip from, with their own airplane. 
but they're just curious if there'd be a benefit into him uh, joining a club, not creating a club with his plane or actually using his plane as the club plane, but if he went to join a club. And I think we've probably talked about the social aspects and stuff, but um, you know, he actually mentions that too. So other than maybe a social benefit, is there anything else? Yeah, we, we see that a lot. I mean, there's if, if your plane is going to be down for annual at some point, right? So it's it's nice to have a, a backup airplane to, to fly. Um, also, too, just uh, flying close enough for a different type of flying if it's a different type of airplane than the one you own and operate from your private strip. So that's a that's a it's a good option to have. It's and it's a great way to fly more and get to know more people. Excellent. Do clubs typically adjust monthly dues as the number of members change, or do they typically leave them the same and just add the extra dues into the general fund? You could you could do it that way. I mean, it's again the the dues the monthly dues cover all those fixed costs. Um, naturally, when you add more pilots to the to the mix, the, your your insurance rate is going to increase, so that's that's going to change. Um, but it's yeah you 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 probably would uh, have to adjust it or you, you don't have to, as long as you're covering all your expenses, that's the important part. Okay. Uh, would a few co-owners that have a monthly assessment for future maintenance, in addition to our rate, be legally considered a club? Hmm. Um, I think a lot of that might depend on a good test is is to say, well, what if what if this disbanded? You know, where does the money go? If the money goes equally to all the members, then you could sort of argue it's it's operating like a like a club. If uh, if if the money goes to one or two people, then you know clearly it's been owned by by somebody more than others. The other problem could be if there are unequal share allocations in the co-ownership, that could cause a problem as well, because now two, a couple of people want two votes, whereas everybody else gets one vote, then you, you lose the democratic freedom then. Gotcha. Hey, there's one here I really want to ask. It's, uh, it says, flying clubs, this person's asking, flying clubs don't sound like a great idea for rusty pilots. It seems like they want more experienced pilots. Do you think that's the case? No, not at all. Um, I think one of the one of the great advantages of flying clubs is the mix of people, the mix of backgrounds, but also the mix of experiences. Um, now, of course, with the flying club itself, there's there's more of a risk if somebody's a new pilot, but but there's you know that that's up to the club for itself to decide. If the club's operating a you know a bonanza, then it may not just be a club requirement; it may be an insurance requirement that you need you know 200 hours in type and you know 50 hours in the last year or, or, or whatever. So there may be some limitations put on from that. But I but I think you will find that the majority of flying clubs are are very welcoming and open to uh, to returning pilots, rusty pilots, and to new aviators, people who who have just just uh, essentially got their their private pilot's license and they're looking to, to to build some proficiency and gain from the mentoring and the experience of, of being involved in a, in a in a multifaceted flying club so so no i think that they're i think both for rusty pilots and new pilots they're, they're wonderful places excellent all right so we do say we're going to try to answer all the questions so but by 12 30 we like to finish because we know people must go places i would be here <laughs> all day if you wanted however uh, seven minutes left. I'm going to try to fly through a couple of these. Okay. Do clubs tend to charge a Lighting daily round. minimum quantity of hours, even if they are not flown, if you say take a plane for two weeks, but fly it only a few hours? Um, generally speaking, no. I mean, you, you certainly can if you want to write your bylaws and your operating rules that way. But again, clubs don't have to make money. There's no profit motive. So no, uh, I would say Oh, my club doesn't. I don't think Steve's clubs does it. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Bert, you know, this is a. I think this is probably so hard to judge, but I'll ask you anyway, since he did one of my local clubs, two thousand dollars to join seems reasonable. What's the norm? <laughs> yeah. Is there a norm? Probably is the question. <laughs> it's, two thousand sounds great. I mean, so many factors, right? <laughs> yeah. Airplane. yeah. Insurance. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. you take you take my club. We it's a it's a non-equity club, so you're not purchasing any part of the airplane. But we live in a it, we live in a busy area where there are lots of pilots. Um, we want to make sure that um, 
you know that the, the members we attract keep keep uh, understand the culture of the club and so on so we actually charge a thousand dollars non-refundable to join the club um, other clubs may charge you know, a couple of hundred. I think a lot of it depends upon where you're located, the, the popularity of the club. Um, a more popular club is going to be more expensive to join because it's more popular, it has a good safety culture, uh, has nice aeroplanes, and of course it, the clubs generally are capped. There's usually a, a maximum number of people which, which most definitely drives the value of membership. And Steve, quick follow-up question to that about your club. Somebody asked way early on, A152, why is it not a C152? Because it's an A for Aerobat. The Aerobat is uh, quite a, it, it's, it's based, it, it sort of looks similar. It looks like a, a, a 152, it's the 110 horsepower Lycoming, um, but it's also beefed up. There's, there's quite a lot of structural improvements and changes. It is plus six minus three G. So it is, it is a bit of a different beast and so it's, uh, it's it, the, the, the model number is A152. Is there a good formula to plan for the ratio of club aircraft to AMPs for maintenance? Realize some outsource maintenance, but if you want to keep it internal, what is a good ratio, 20 to one? <laughs> uh, I would say any AMP you can get is a, is a good one if they, if they agree to, to work, work with your flying club. Um, my my club on our field we don't even have a mechanic so it's you know anytime we need work done we're either paying someone to drive to us or we're we're flying somewhere to get work done so um i i don't know and yeah i think any any a &P, what do you think steve i i think so i mean you, the 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 club airplane is going to need all, all of its normal things we won't go into the inspection question at the moment at least the 100 hour <laughs> that's a whole that's all another hour discussion um but also, we often find that flying club members enjoy under, uh, knowing their aeroplane, um, doing uh, owner-assisted annuals, doing as much as the maintenance they, as they can under Part 43. These are all wonderful ways to, to keep the club engaged, actually, and to get to know your aeroplane better. Um, so I, I'm not sure there's a magic number there. If you happen to operate on a field where there's a couple of uh, maintenance shops, then just, just go along with that. Um, we, we, there are some rules about compensating CFIs and compensating A and Ps. Uh, again, that's that's going to take us in a in a very different direction. And and as long as everyone is obeying the rules, then no one should come at, should come across those limitations. So this hey, one, Paul, is, I got uh, one here. I think uh, if I could just this one real quick. Can someone over 75 years of age join a club as a non-pilot, but then fly with other club members not as pilot in command? Is that something you see happen in clubs? Yeah, we do. There, there's quite a quite a, a lot of clubs have the idea of a, of a flying member and a non-flying member, and the non-flying members are are it's essentially to be part of the um, the social aspect of it. In, indeed, some some people as they as they start getting older may decide to hang up their headset and uh, you know voluntarily reduce to sort of relegate themselves, I suppose, to to non-flying member, but still may perhaps they even still keep their share if it's an equity an equity club um okay. so so absolutely and uh, what we do what i what we do in, in in our club we decided yeah absolutely we want we want social members but we're not going to call it social members and charge people we're just we opened up our doors if you want to come along to one of our meetings come to along one of our meetings if you want to come and eat a burger with us you know just put a fiver in the pot uh, to help with the uh, with the chips cool or yeah, no uh, something else uh so <laughs> this has been asked in different variations can club members be held liable for another's accident? So, um, you, you know, this maybe <laughs> <laughs> we we find a lot of our a lot of our answers to questions like this. Well, uh, maybe um, in cases of pure negligence, anything goes, right? Um, so you can have all the waivers in place and liability protection, but if there's there's if there's absolute negligence, then then sort of anything is open. But that's why we 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 organise as um, LLCs and hopefully uh, non-profit corporations to bring some liability protection, third-party liability protection. It's why we have liability insurance. It's why you, as a club owner, may decide to get additional liability insurance to to help you with such claims. Um, so it's nothing, anything particular to do with flying clubs. It's just to do with organizations and groups of people. Yeah. And to that effect, this is a quick question. 
to help people protect themselves, does AOPA have a template with bylaws, lease agreement, et cetera, that can be leveraged and or plagiarized, it says? Yes, yeah. we absolutely do. Yeah, uh, on our website, downloadable resources is right there. We also can help you find a AOPA panel attorney in your state, because a lot of these things are state specific. So it, it helps, if we, we recommend that you con uh, consult with a local attorney when you are finalizing all the documents for your flying club. All of our documents come with a disclaimer. Right? We, we can't guarantee that it's what you want or what your state wants. So you, you really do need to make sure that it's what you want and make sure it abides by the laws of your, your local state. Excellent. Well, guys, every good thing must come to an end. And even though we do have a couple outstanding questions, and I mean that both literally and figuratively, um, <laughs> the time has come to say goodbye. It is 1230. And I would, I think we'll probably continue this offline because I love you guys so much. However, it is 12:30. We must say goodbye. So, well, even, and it can be continued offline. Just contact our Flying Clubs Initiative. They will be glad to talk to you, folks. Brought to you by Boeing. Stephen. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. See you guys. Thank you so much. See y'all. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.